Welcome listeners to another episode of Pateo Radio. My name is Jon Oldenkamp and it is today May 21, 2014. The special guest of tonight is of this broadcast is coming from the United States of America and his name is Gene Odening. Gene, please welcome into the show. Well, thank you, Johan. It's great to be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm really pleased that you are here. I've listened to many <laughs> of your um, recordings with uh, Jan Irving. Um, uh, yes. And Jan was also a guest in, in uh, Pate Radio a while ago. And right. um, yeah, I, I really admire the way you explain things really, really quietly, really easily. And um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's really fascinating to 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 take that all in, so to say. Well, good. I'm glad you found some uh, value there. Yeah, <laughs> it's a great value. But maybe we start with with uh, with Eugene. Um, um, can you share a little bit of background information of uh, the individual that you are? Well, I'll I'll start by giving my age. I'm now uh, 68 years of age, but uh, uh, I became uh, interested uh, about 14 or 15 years ago in in a movement that's uh, taking place here in the United States, which is home education, but rather than sending uh, their children to school, various families uh, have decided to to uh, educate their their children in mm. in primary and secondary schooling at home rather than being sent to government uh, public school. And uh, although I went to public school throughout my uh, uh, primary and secondary uh, schooling career, mm -hmm. I had. Uh, several um, mentors uh, with whom I studied after school, mostly in my adolescent or teenage years. Uh, one was a dentist, and um, I had been interested in going into the profession, but he started me out with, rather than concentrating on the the dental arts themselves, uh, trying to give me a more well-rounded education. He was my family dentist, and at age 13, I started uh, going to his office every day after school, and during the uh, summer vacation, I would spend the entire day there during the week. And as I say, he started with a very uh, general education, and I later found out that this was the uh, first of the uh, seven liberal arts that he was really uh, communicating to me, the, the trivium, as it's called, mm -hmm. um, general grammar, Aristotelian logic and uh, formal rhetoric. And it was this uh, a combination of being taught a more general education that I was, than I was actually getting in, in public school. And then later on, about a year and a half after I started with this gentleman, um, he began to, to get me more involved with the uh, specifics of, of the dental arts and sciences, which, which has its own um, has its own terminology. So the way he started me out was simply to take a small desk dictionary and I would sit in a room and copy the dictionary. I would start with the first three words in the dictionary uh, under A and I would just copy it out onto a loose leaf piece of paper and with the pronunciation and the definition. Then I'd go to, to the letter B and do the same thing for the next three and so on and so forth. And I didn't have to get very far into that when I started to see how easily, as he gave me the the more specific books, the more technical books regarding dentistry, how easily I was starting to pick this the, this uh, nomenclature up. Um, it, it was just going into my head effortlessly. And, and uh, he was saying it was because I was starting to have my brain um, programmed. My mm -hmm. mind was being programmed essentially by this exercise of, of uh, dictionary um, copying. And he said this is the way the, the, the scribes of old, before the printing press, uh, educated themselves. Uh, everyone educated himself by, by starting these, these copying um, procedures. And then later on he, he introduced me after he understood that I had some uh, background really through my mother's uh, schooling when she went to uh, public school in the 1920s and she was given the uh, background in general grammar and general grammar is really the the rules of grammar itself 
general grammar is is the description of the way we use language, the way we use words, uh, sentences which are complete thoughts, and a number of complete thoughts, paragraphs, and finally propositions, and and uh, other types of of uh, uh, discourse. Mm -hmm. But uh, she gave me this uh, when I was age nine, this idea of general grammar. And uh, what it communicated to me at age nine was that the rules of grammar, which I was being given in, in uh, public school, are not just abstract uh, conventions, not, not just rules that are made up, but they actually make a connection to things in reality, to the things. Now, she didn't specify this to me. This was given to me later. But she said the things that, that we take into our being and we take uh, the world, the, the universe around us into our being through our five uh, physical senses. Can you, have and a, so, can you give a, a small example maybe for the listeners to follow what you're saying? Yes. Um, she said, today we're going to get in the car. I'm going to drive you to school this morning. Mm -hmm. We're going to leave a little bit early. And I'm going to point uh, things out to you, and I want you to tell me what they are. So we got in the car. We started to drive out the, the driveway, and she pointed next door, and she says, what's that? And I said, that's, that's a car. There was a car parked in the driveway. She said, fine. Uh, what's that? She pointed to the house, a house. What's that? She pointed to a tree, a tree. Uh, what's that? There's a dog. And so we drove the, the several blocks to school, and she kept pointing these things out. And about midway there, she said, everything that I have pointed out and that you have returned a word with, a descriptive word, are nouns. You know, before that, a noun to me was a proper noun, a uh, 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 general noun, et cetera, et cetera. It was, just, it was just an abstraction. And suddenly, just with that one explanation, she, she uh, allowed me to see that these these uh, communications through grammar actually related to things in the world. And the very next day, uh, she started to point out, uh, uh, all right, what is the color of that car? She pointed to the same things and asked me various things. Uh, is, is that a large house or a small house? And so on and so forth. And she said, these are adjectives. The very next day, she started to point out... Um, movement or states of being what what is that car doing over there it's it's driving down the street what is this one next door doing it's parked then she explained to me what verbs were actions and state of states of being and then in the next day the fourth day we we talked about relations um what are those two people that are next door oh that is the uncle of the girl the uncle of. So that was a relationship. Uh, where is the bird now? It's on top of the branch. So that was the relationship of the bird to the branch of the tree. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the end of five days after, after doing this, um, I understood that all these, all these terms that described uh, the world showed me that there was something that, that I could take in uh, through my five senses and see that they were re related to reality. Now, later on, and it wasn't that much longer, it was about a year later when I understood that once you know what reality is, your, your relationship to the universe, uh, that which you take in through the sense that is common to all of us, we all have these five senses and we can communicate with it, we can also determine that there is something called unreality. That is, these things that, that can actually be nouns and pronouns and verbs that are abstractions, that are not necessarily within reality. Now, unreality, now I could tell the difference between reality and unreality, and unreality is not necessarily... Um, false or, or illusion. It simply is an abstraction. So even at the age of, of um, 
10, I could tell the difference because of this exercise that was done by my mother, or with my mother, uh, that there was such a thing as reality and unreality. So later on, of course, I, I started to uh, differentiate this as existence and consciousness. Existence is what is. Consciousness is aware, awareness of it. Uh, much later, I, I came upon another um, description that existence is identification, or I'm sorry, existence is identity. That's what we're doing when we use these abstract words. We see that something has an identity. A thing is what it is. And consciousness is the ability to identify it. So existence is identity. Consciousness is identification. And those are basically the the uh, two things that are within our purview is, as as uh, humans, that there that there is an existence and that we have an awareness of it. Great. Um, yeah. So we can, can, yeah, can it say was that's very simple. Yeah. So so we can say the the higher your consciousness, or the broader it is, the wider it is, the more advanced it is, the more things you are able to identify. That's correct. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And and of course the next the next step is. Once you have identified through identification many of these things, like I say, you take words and make them, a word in itself is not a complete thought. It's just a, a, a designation of something. The first complete thought is a sentence. You have a subject and, and a predicate. You're, you have a subject of which you are speaking of and you're saying something about it. So that's the predicate. So there's a thing, and then there's something that's being said about it. And you can put several of these together to communicate an entire uh, idea, or, or as you mentioned, a broader communication. Now, as the, as the communication gets broader and more complex, there's a tendency to possibly come upon some contradictions. In other words, maybe the third sentence in your uh, proposition might might not uh, um, go completely with the fourteenth sentence. I'm just using these as as odd examples, but that's called a contradiction. Mm -hmm. So the next step after gathering a body of knowledge together sequentially or grammatically is to see if there are any contradictions. Are there any contradictions in the statement? Or are there any contradictions in your view of the statement, in your interpretation of the statement? And this leads to the, um, to the discipline of logic. And I was uh, given logic, uh, the, the bases of logic, uh, by my mentor starting at age 14, this family dentist. And so, uh, after school every day, half of the time that I spent in his presence, we were talking about about logic and and the four branches of logic itself, and then the rest of the time that I spent directly with him uh, was spent in the uh, description of the dental arts and sciences. So, uh, logic is is a method by which to eliminate uh, contradictions. If all if all sentences within a proposition describing a phenomenon uh, do not are not of a whole, you find the idea, the sentence, the complete thought in there that doesn't belong. And this is what logic tends to do through its, its uh, four branches. Um, the one that I concentrated on, uh, or that I was made to concentrate on because I was uh, studying a, a specialized science, was the uh, area of definition, uh, the definition of, of um, concepts and words as described by Aristotle. And, and he uses uh, the genus or the general idea into which a, a uh, concept belongs. And then you find the differentiation of that, that specific thing you're talking about as compared to the general idea. For example, uh, we could look at uh, a small four-legged furry animal that was outside the window, and he would 
he would ask, uh, what is that? And I would say, uh, you want the genus or differentia? And he'd say, give me the genus. And I'd say, animal. And he said, uh, what is its differentia? And I would say, cat. So the animal was the genus, the cat was the was the uh, uh, the one that differentiated it from all other four-legged furry animals that didn't have its structure, like from a dog or from a cow or from a bear. And uh, of course, we went into the lexi the lexicon of dentistry from there, which is is far more technical and specialized. But even at age uh, fourteen, you you can take these very technical terms. In, into your processing if it's given to you in this very systematized fashion. Mm -hmm. And um, by the time I was 16, two years later, I was, rather than copying from a, from a dictionary, I was to take what I was reading or observing uh, out of these technical uh, books and manuals or what I was observing in the clinic or the laboratory, and put them in my own hand, uh, give my own explanation. And this, of course, leads you to rhetoric, which is really showing what you know to yourself by, by writing something out or by describing it to, a, to another party, to another person, uh, especially a, a person who is completely unfamiliar with the, with the subject, and you can have them paraphrase back to you what you have just told or written to them, then you know that you, you have a, a good knowledge of the subject and an understanding of the subject, which means understanding means that you have no contradictions within that large, that broad statement. And that, that's all understanding is, is, is a, a statement without contradictions in it. Logic is, is, is uh, defined as the, uh, uh, the um, art of non-contradictory identification. So this is getting your mind to identify without contradictions that which you observe. And, and the 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 <laughs> the confusion can come up if you don't have a good grasp of, of general grammar that there are such things that you can um, that a person can identify and and communicate that is in reality but you can also identify and communicate complete abstractions which which exist only in the mind which do not have material existence and this is where a lot of confusion comes up. The, the trivium itself is developed and can, can most easily be used uh, in the realm of, of uh, the intellect, of, of using the brain to see its environment or its surroundings. Now, there's another segment uh, of the mind or the brain uh, which has to do with, with our emotional life and our, or what we call our intuitive life. Many people call this spirituality. And I'm not advocating, I, I've been misunderstood in the past, that I advocate through the trivium as this being the way to perceive human life. And I want to make the distinction that this is a way to distinguish and and uh, describe intellectual the intellectual life of the mind and the spiritual life or the those uh, those actions and relationships that provide our our satisfactions and our motivations our emotional life uh, is in addition to this I'm not saying that that uh, you select one or the other. These are complementary um, okay, uh, yeah. pieces of life. Yeah. I, I see why you say this, uh, uh, Gene, but um, <laughs> I'm also a student of, uh, of, uh, of this principle, of the, of the trivium and many other things. I'm also a psychologist, 
And uh, yeah. I also apply this to understanding emotions because you can start, you can make a grammar of, of our emotions and you can to understand the logic of it and the reason why they have it, why they occur and, and so on. So uh, to me, the trivium is actually a, a method to to investigate everything, uh, both the physical and the metaphysical world and uh, and everything which is in us and everything that, which is around us. So to me, it's the, it's the basic tool to 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 understand and um, so I'm, I'm really, I, really happy with what you're explaining here. I agree with your explanation just now that this <laughs> is a place to start. Yeah, because otherwise I've, I've seen so many psychologists try to explain emotions but they, they don't start with grammar, they just they, they, yeah, they mix up all the things and they try to make some kind of sense of it but if you don't have a foundation then you cannot build a house, so it's it's right. uh, it's it's ridiculous uh, to me. So, um, and yeah, but <laughs> but you're the guest, so <laughs> let's continue. To me, to me, um, the trivium is is a method ha- of of learning how to learn. And if you if you understand how to learn, then you can apply this method to any any subject, uh, no Absolutely. matter what no matter what it is. So, please continue with your explanation, uh, Gene. No, I I think you you summed it up. Uh, I, I detected that you thought that I was trying to explain these as two separate um, procedures. And what I'm saying is that they're complementary. And you describe that very well by saying you can start with the intellect to describe all other phenomena, including that of, of emotion. Uh, I've just, I'm just becoming very um, sensitive to this idea that that everything uh, is only intellect, and you have just described through through your uh, lens of psychology that this is a place to start, so that you can so that you can describe and and uh, explore other aspects of mind. Yeah, because to me, emotions are just a feedback mechanism, and um, and the way we feel are just telling us. Um, like, like we're sitting in the car and we're looking at a dashboard. The dashboard is giving us feedback of, of how we're doing, how fast we're going and so on, how much gasoline there is in the car. And that's what, what, um, what our emotions doing too. If we're going in the right direction or uh, if, if we don't have enough energy or whatever, that's, that's what it's telling us. And it's not, nothing more than that. So, um, it doesn't help us to understand the world. Um, what I see in, in new age that people think, oh no, you should not think too much. You should go for your, for right. each- Intuition and uh, just just let it be. Well, I don't think you get any any result if you do it like that because you'll you'll be <laughs> walking into circles and you'll not get anywhere. So you need a firm method, and that method is of course the trivium. Otherwise, you'll get lost. That's how I see. Well, it. that separate that separates us from the animals. What you were just describing the the intuition or the uh, the emotions that are are the reactive uh, mechanisms that we share with the animals. Mm-hmm. These are our perceptions. Now, we can learn from perceptions. Now, perceptions are automatic. Uh, open your eyes and you see. Uh, a noise is made and you can't help but hear. But you take a number of these perceptions, and as a conceptual being, which uh, humans are the only ones who have... have uh, been seen to be conceptual, we can, we can learn from a number of perceptions to put a concept together. Uh, Aristotle described it as, as hold an object in your hand and an image is, is made in the mind, uh, which is a perception. Uh, you're, you're seeing this, you're feeling it, possibly you have an aroma of whatever it is you're holding in your hand, and then you make an abstraction of it that it that is symbolized, and we're the only ones that have been seen to be able to symbolize this, say with a spoken word like apple, mm-hmm. or a written word a p p l e, and so forth. So you're describing the conceptual capacity of man, which is to see that which is around him, and because of his ability to to abstract, to model things within his head around what what he sees. If he has sufficient understanding of the world around him, he can make an artifact to to modify um, his surroundings. He can make a wheel, for example, put it on an axle, and and now he can 
build a cart and carry more than he could just on his back. He can make tools. So yes, I say that this is where humans can identify their their intuitions and emotions and build upon that. They can they can model reality uh which hasn't yet occurred. And and of course, if there are no contradictions within that model, it'll work in the real world. Therefore, it can be said to be true. And and this leads us to this uh concept that we've come up call science, which b- was built upon after we had the concept of philosophy, which was built upon when we had the concept of mythology, where we where we imagined um, uh, spiritual uh, entities being behind all physical objects. Yeah, I can, I can fully follow what you're saying, but when I look at university science, we have nowadays at, uh, <laughs> at, at our schools uh, and the universities, of course, I think there are a lot, there's a lot of things uh, not right with the grammar they use and the logic that is in there and, and, and the way they apply it. So if they would really use the trivium, they would, they would delete a lot of uh, false dogmas that are there. So um, I, I prefer to call it scientism instead of science because it's, it's more like a, a belief system. It's not really science. Real science to me is always based on a very clear grammar very clear logic or dialectic and and very clear application of that dialectic so that's that's how i look at it but maybe uh, you have a different view on this no no you you articulated it precisely precisely yeah maybe for the listeners if they're not familiar with this this trinity of grammar logic and rhetoric you can also explain it like like a, an input throughput and output system i think uh, can can you uh, explain that to the listeners if you want Yes, that that is uh, a formulation uh, which I didn't derive. This, this has been used by other people uh, since the advent of the computer era. Mm-hmm. That this is the way a, a, an electronic mechanical computer works. Of course, that that it does have an input, a processing, and an output. And we can look at the input as being the the uh, uh, the mouse and and the keyboard, and this is how, or or uh, a scanner, and this is how we put information into the into the memory, into the electronics of the computer, and then the computer itself, through algorithms, through instructions that are essentially mathematically based, process it to find that which uh, is related to the other. In other words, uh, finding relationships among the various items that were put in there. And this is, of course, what's called computer logic. And uh, the logic, of course, must be programmed uh, by a human. These algorithms are, are devised by humans and then refined through other algorithms. That's where we're, that's the point that we're at now. But once something is processed, the, the, the logic or dialectic, as you call it, it's not really dialectic within, within the uh, computer because it's, it doesn't have a dialogue as we do with, within our brain, within our mind, where we hold the idea in one part of the brain and it's processed in the other. Uh, the, the computer just runs it through the algorithm or sets of algorithm and comes up with a consistent output, which is shown on the computer screen, uh, the printer, and uh, the output devices that it that it that it may have. Uh, now we're doing 3D printing and so on and so forth. But this is the input of the computer: the the uh, mouse and and uh, keyboard is is the grammar stage. This this is where you put a body of knowledge together. Uh, several uh, complete thoughts, several sentences, uh, any number of sentences, and then it goes into the into the computer to take the the contradictions that are within that body of knowledge out until uh, what is yielded in the output or on the screen is that which is consistent. So th- this is your your body of knowledge that has 
brought has been brought about through understanding or through elimination of contradictions to a rhetorical um, uh, output. Uh, it's now ready to be communicated or to be used for uh, another purpose, for an artifact or for another abstraction uh, within a within a, a larger body of knowledge. So it's really that simple. And yeah. it was the it was the human who devised, who created the electronic computer uh, on a model of of the workings of his own mind. Exactly, the, the transformation from knowledge, the body of knowledge, which is the grammar, to understanding, which is logic, and then finally to wisdom, which is rhetoric. So it's the same same principle. And and wisdom is is knowledge and understanding, which is usable in the real world. Mm -hmm. If if it's not usable in the real world, it's it's not really wisdom. It's it's a, a more uh it can be imagination because you can take an imaginative uh proposition and make it internally consistent. And this is done a lot in mathematics. Uh you you can take uh an algorithm and make it internally consistent and uh, there are no contradictions within the statement mathematically or within mythology. You can make mythology um, uh, internally consistent. Uh, at some point, someone will challenge the mythology or, or will challenge the, the uh, uh, mathematical composition. Mathematics cannot be uh, falsified necessarily. It is an ab abstraction unto itself. But something that, that is being explained verbally or, or in print uh, can, be, can be challenged and shown to be uh, possibly inconsistent. And, and that is mythology, which is uh, based upon the authority of, of someone saying that it is so. And this is leads to, to one of the branches of, of logic or, or dialectic, which are the logical fallacies, which are, are fallacies. The informal logical fallacies are, are just um, statements of fallacious thinking that are so common that uh, a list has been made of them. And you can check your own, your own uh, thought process to see if you are being consistent or inconsistent with these, with these several number of, of fallacies uh, to be used as a shortcut rather than using um, the individual uh, definition of each term or each word and then the other two branches of logic which is the way the mind works it, it does only two things when it's when when the human mind is processing it's taking ideas apart or it's putting ideas together. When you're taking ideas apart, you, are, you have already accepted uh, a statement or an observation of a statement, and uh, you are, are deducing from a general... Here we go back to, to definition again. You are deducing from a general statement uh, something that follows from it, one of its components. Going in the other direction you are making observations of similar phenomena and after seeing the consistent results of a phenomena over time you make a general statement mm -hmm. and that is that is an inductive statement that is generalizing and there is a, uh, a a way which we have discovered that is is quite reliable in generalizing and it is what we've been discussing science physical science yeah indeed indeed it is yeah, I think I've heard on a radio show with you and uh, John Irving was mentioning the logical fallacies and you were explaining them one by one. Um, maybe I can look it up, but just maybe give one example. For instance, the Petitio Principi um, might be a good one to explain for the listeners. What, what is a logical fallacy? Well, it's, it's an inconsistent uh, a statement. Uh, it, uh, Petitio Principi, for example, is uh, circular reasoning. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that is to use uh, to use an example of what you're trying to prove or, or what you're trying to uh, be convincing about 
and and you just use uh, the the same thing in a, in in a uh, in a circular statement. Uh, for example, um, uh, there there is a um, someone goes to the bank and wants to make a loan, and and the loan officer says, "Well, I can't make a loan to you because I don't know you. I don't know your character." And this is the example that I use with with Jan. Mm-hmm. And you say, "Well, I thought of that, so I brought my next door neighbor in, who's known me for years, and he can vouch for my reliability and character." And and the uh, the bank officer says, "Well, I don't know him, uh, so I I can't really use." his vouching for you as as a reference and and you say well that's all right i've known him for years and i can tell you that that he is a reliable person so here you are just going in circles you're not really you're not really getting to the character of anyone that's that's just a, a fallacy that we often look at exactly. uh, there, yeah. there 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 is a let's say in in the in the christian tradition uh there is one god uh, why is that? Because it says so in the Bible. Well, what does the Bible have have to do with there being one God? Well, that is the Word of God. The one, the one I like also very much is um, is the gravity principle. Because yeah, why does an apple fall from the tree? It's because of gravity. What is gravity? That's the force that makes the apple fall from the tree. Right. So, so right. <laughs> we've not learned anything yet. It's just describing what happens, but that's not a force of nature. It's just a description of what we see happening. But that's by by well, that's the, yeah. that's the effect. Exactly. That's the effect. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But we don't know the cause yet. And in fact, um, the man who made that famous, uh, Mister Newton. Newton, yes. Yeah. Uh, he was asked when he was uh, forming the Royal Society, I believe after he came up with the description, and they were consistent descriptions, mathematical descriptions, of, of uh, falling objects or objects that move, and they could be seen to be consistent mathematically. And uh, they kept asking him, well, what is gravity? And he kept refusing. He says, I don't know. And they wouldn't accept that as an answer, because they insisted that, that they know. Well, much uh, technology has been built on the description of the effect without knowing the cause. And um, I don't know that we know the cause of many things that we see right in front of us. What is matter? What is energy? We, we have uh, descriptions of portions of those things, but, but what are they ultimately? Uh, I don't know. And that's one of the things that I have found personally, as, as a person living through life, uh, having come upon this the ideas of the trivium as as a way to come to a uh, an approximation of what might be true is being that it's one of the liberal arts that is one of the arts uh, the arts and sciences that can free the individual mind that that was the original term used for the trivium and the quadrivium is that they were to to give you personal freedom and one of the things that I have found, because I can I can know the limits of, of what I know or, or what humans in general can know, is that which uh, Isaac Newton said, I don't know. I can very comfortably and confidently, without any destruction to, to my uh, self-esteem, the way I view myself, say, I don't know. Because I have a method by which to test it. If it's important to me, I can start this process, this three-step process of looking into it. And it may take a while, or I just may dismiss it at the beginning because it doesn't interest me. But this idea that you can, that you, you can look for provisional truth rather than absolute truth uh, does so much to liberate your mind. Uh, you spend so much less time uh, going in circles, looking for answers, and uh, and you have the confidence to go on. What what else is important in your life? What will make your life better, more free, so on and so forth, exactly. as an individual? Yeah. Yes. 
Yeah, that's why I like the, the, the metaphor so much of building a house on rock versus a house uh, that is built on, on sand. Because um, when you understand the trivium, then you, you know how to make a house that is on rock and that has a, has a good foundation and it will not <laughs> fall apart the moment it starts to rain or the wind becomes too, uh, too, too strong. And, exactly. Uh, yeah, and I think that's, that's what the, the parable was all about, um, knowing what is true and not letting yourself be guided by what, uh, what others have told you that was true because you have to mm-hmm. check it for yourself. You have to create your own grammar, your own logic, and your own rhetoric in order to see if it's, if it's true for you, if you can build your house on, the, on that foundation. And the great thing about the trivium is it's usable by, potentially all humans can use it. So you become your own best authority. Mm -hmm. You don't look to the authority of others. Uh, If Again, if it interests you, you can check the authority. You you can go through this three-step principle. Uh, You can keep asking questions of he who is called the authority. And, and finally, at, at the end of the process, uh, you have the, 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 the self-esteem to call yourself the ultimate uh, authority. And this is really what the trivium is. It's a way to um, construct your mind so that you are discerning as to what you accept. Because ultimately, there, there are things in life that, that we really have no control over. We find ourselves in this time, in this place. And there are things around us which we can do nothing about. However, we can always do something about the way we interpret things. Mm-hmm. And this is where the trivium comes in, into play to determine, can, can I? It, it really builds judgment is what I'm saying. Can I do something about this situation? Can I gather a group of people together to do something about this or not? However, finally, in the final analysis, I can do something about the way I, I interpret or the way I see it. Will I accept what's being told to me? Will I accept what's being told through the, through the news media? Will I accept what's being told to me by the, by the science professor in, in the university. And you can, you can decide to accept it through good judgment, through having gone through the process, or not. And there again, that, that leads to freedom, because you can go on to the next thing that you find important in your life. Exactly, and that's, that's the main difference between taking authority as truth instead of taking truth as authority. So, exactly. Yeah, finding out what is really true, not based on what's, what, uh, what he tell or whatever. And yeah. you are the arbiter. You, the individual, you are the arbiter of yes. truth. You are the one who decides. Exactly. Exactly. You should not uh, hide. I think people who take authority for truth, they are actually cowards because they don't want to take responsibility for their own truth. They are maybe too lazy to do their own work or, or whatever. But um, I think every human being should... Um, you should take his own resp- responsibility for his own truth, because that's the, that's from you. That's your own house. So uh, better better take care of it. Well, not being uh, exposed, we I had mentioned this on Jan Irvin's show, and a lot of people seem to have gotten something out of it. Not being exposed to these principles. I mean, I I feel fortunate that I had one particular person who provided these to me, mm-hmm. and and he did it. You know, within a few minutes every day after school, over a long period of time, over eight years. Um, but if you're not given this, uh, we we are we are taken out of our nat- this. This is actually a natural way that that our mind works to observe, uh, t- to learn from that observation, uh, to understand it by taking the the uh, uh, contradictions out of it. So that we can do something in the real world, we can we can do an action which affects our lives, and uh, children do this. You'll you'll see them observing and asking and and trying to to understand things, but they're taken out of this with the with the various uh, uh, forces that that are within society, within mm-hmm. civilization and culture. And uh, if if you're not reintroduced to it, 
in in at some point in your life at 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 a period in time in your life when you're open to it, then I don't know that it can be called lazy. Um, yeah, maybe you're, maybe I'm too harsh. <laughs> that's, that's possible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I understand what you say. Yeah, but because I I said to to Jan, I said we implicitly know these things, and and we can we can um, have this intuition that we know something, and yet we don't explicitly know it. We we can't give you step one, step two, step three, as as to what our knowledge and understanding is. No. Uh, in a, in a rhetorical in a rhetorical statement, so that's why I found that these are skills. The, these ideas have to be one of the things that that was occurring. For example, like when my mother was driving me to school when I was nine years old, is she would cover one uh, part of speech per day, and all she covered was were the nouns. Uh, Adjectives, Adjective. verbs, and adverbs, and mm -hmm. and the uh, prepositional phrases, and uh, we did that in four days. And and the fifth day, she put it all together and told me that that uh, that is a that, that these are the components of complete thoughts. And she was given this in public school when she was nine years old. So uh, back in the nineteen twenties, in the Western United States. Uh, they were still being taught these very um, uh, consolidated ways of teaching people. They were actually teaching them how to learn, how to think. Uh, they weren't doing that in the eastern part of the United States. I, I understand we had already gone into uh, into another method of of, of uh, not really education, but domestication of people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In the eastern part of the U.S., train them but, to be uh, obedient. Yes, 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 exactly. Yeah. And and it seems to be over time that this is what occurs: is we go through periods, general periods of time, when uh, when we are trying to be made obedient, and being that we are creatures that learn, we find out what what the what the mind game is that's being played on us. And we find ways to get around it. And then we get into that period of time when people are learning and being taught. And evidently this is the way we, we progress. But since, uh, one of the thing, one of the reasons I mentioned my age, uh, early on is since I turned 55, I've been reviewing most of the literature that, uh, that I had come in contact with when I was in university and, and, Early life, early adult life, and I just see it in a in a completely different uh, light now. Okay. All these things that you and I are discussing as being situations that occur in today's world have have been uh, gone through by humanity just time and time and time again. It seems, and I I think you have to be a, of a mature uh, age. Because I'm no longer uh, concerned with with my actions for my family, uh, for my surroundings, for for my vocation. I, I'm what the Indians, the uh, uh, Indic uh, people, the Vedic people would say. I'm in the world, but no longer of it. And it's a it's a tremendous perspective to have. You're beyond you have some, you, you have some you have something to look forward to <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> most of the time I'm also beyond this uh, this physical realm um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm making the grammar of the metaphysical world and um, and that really helps me to understand all the ancient uh, scriptures all these so-called holy scriptures because uh, they make a lot of sense once you have that grammar so um, that, that was one of the things that I saw on your site that, that attracted me. Mm. To, to your, your thought is you said that there is much to be said in there's much to be had out of ancient scripture and there is and that's one of the things that I'm um, looking back upon right now um, rather than than the literal translation that most of ancient scripture or or mythology is really are really examples they take an ideal and 
and tell the story of that ideal. Exactly. And that's where you learn. Exactly. If, yeah, if you know the grammar of, of, uh, of the metaphysical world, then all the stories become really easy to read because they, they use different words to, use, to refer to the same metaphysical uh, 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 concept, so to say, the metaphysical uh, identity. And um, and once you can make those connections, then everything falls uh, falls into place. I'm just now <laughs> trying to write it out as clearly as I can, and then I will uh, will send it out, and I will also give you a copy uh, when it's ready. But I, I think that's that's uh, that's very important because the metaphysical world is telling us so much more about the logic uh, behind our physical world um, that we actually need to do it. And and I think the ancient uh, Greek scientists. They did everything. When you look at Pythagoras and and, uh, and Plato and and Socrates, they were not talking about the physical world. Only Aristotle became more interested in the physical world, but the others were much more interested in the metaphysical world. So um, that, that's, that's that's what holy science is to me. It's it's studying uh, the the world beyond this world in order to, in order to understand this world much better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe we don't have well, much. I, I, yeah, I applaud your I applaud your trying to integrate. Uh, what I would term mythology, philosophy, and uh, and science to to make it of a whole. Exactly. Yeah, that's what that's what holy science is. It's, yeah, that's that's what holy science is. It, yes. it makes it whole again. <laughs> we don't we don't have much more time uh, to go into depth everything. But what really I like about um, the way you explain things is uh, to say that uh, a square plus b square is c square. The, the famous rule of uh, of uh, Pythagoras, um, yeah. meaning the trivium is a three three square and the quadrivium is a four. Four square, um, and the hypotenusa is then, of course, the five square, which are the five senses. Maybe you can uh, say a little bit about this for the listeners to explain it even better. Well, uh, in today's world, we do, we don't give uh, a lot of credence to to the five senses, and uh, you used on your site you mentioned the common sense, which I brought up earlier, as uh, as the ancients used it. Mm -hmm. That this is this is the starting point. This is our connection, uh, the metaphysical to the physical world, are our five senses. So this is the starting point. And then the next part of the of the yeah, right angle triangle uh, is is three. It's it's a three four five right angle triangle. It's it's three units in one direction at at the uh, right angle, it's four units, and the hypotenuse is five units. So the metaphor has been, since ancient times, and I really think it was developed in, in India, pre-Grecian uh, times, okay. uh, was that we start by using our five senses to go to the the way our mind works, the trivium, by, by studying uh, knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. And finally, by using uh, that that which is expressed by number, which we can quantify uh, the world both through unreality and reality. And the, the four segments of the quadrivium are arithmetic, geometry, music, or uh, harmonic theory, harmony, and finally uh, astronomy or cosmology. So arithmetic is... is uh, an abstraction itself. It it does not exist in in physical world. It it is an in unreality. Geometry is using the abstraction of number to describe physicality, extension in space. So geometry is number in space. Music or harmony is to use number the abstraction of number in the dimension of time or duration and that really is what music is it's 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 uh, uh, harmony or disharmony within with over a period of time over a duration and finally cosmology or astronomy is to use number to see how the the bodies around us the heavenly bodies over time move through space and that is the description of astronomy and the connections that that it makes. Um, I, I pretty much stick to the scientific connections. Um, there are 
effects on humans and animals with with one astronomical body, uh, especially which is the moon, and we see that in the in the cycles of our of our moods within menstrual cycles and so on and so forth. Exactly. So yeah. there there yeah. it is. There it is. It's number itself, number in space, number in time, and number in space and time. Yeah. And and with those with those with that right angle triangle, you you can get to an approximation of what is what is truth. We could we could call it. Yeah. The the way I explain it is that grammar, logic, and rhetoric are the the courses for for the the foundation for the 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 base education. And yes. arithmetic, geometry, and harmonics and cosmology are the, the advanced courses. So let's say uh, uh, the the upper <laughs> upper part of the education. Um, but if you and then you need, of course, that the, the trinity of the tri trivium for each of those four subjects of those four advanced subjects. Because before you start to uh, work with arithmetic, you first need to have a grammar. What what exactly. are the, what are the numbers and so on? Yeah. But but that is that is the uh, that is the sequence five three four the five yeah. three four right angle triangle. Yeah. You start with the senses. You you start with perception. Uh, the trivium leads you to concepts or conception, and finally the the quadrivium uh, leads you to uh, communication and utilization. Yeah, it's astonishing this beauty. I think the, the ancient Greek knew this, of course, the, at least the, the ones who were free, because I like to call it the seven liberating arts, because yes. I don't like to yes. put liberal so much. Um, <laughs> li liberating. <laughs> but, but I think it was rediscovered in the, in the Renaissance. Uh, but, but nowadays only the elite children, uh, they, they are learned this. And uh, yeah, our so-called general education, uh, Hardly tells us anything about this, so that's that's a big, um, <laughs> big missed uh, opportunity here. Yes, it is. It right. is. That's why I became so interested in home education. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I'm giving now home education, but now to adults. <laughs> they come to my workshops and and training weeks, um, and and I'm training them in in this uh, in these seven liberating arts, and um, that's that's not easy to do because yeah, no, you have to get rid of so much. Um, yeah, concepts that you think they're true, but you're not really have defined them. For instance, people talk about the soul and the spirit a lot, but um, when I ask them what they really mean, then they 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 cannot give a good answer. So we need to first start with the grammar of even uh, understanding ourselves and define what a soul and a spirit is. And if you can't do it, then just forget about those words and use other words mm -hmm. that that you can define uh, uh, in a better way. It was interesting when I was involved. Um there were several families that I was directly involved with uh, to, to really just introduce them to the trivium. And the children were, um, were uh, adolescents as well as preteen. Um, so the, the younger children, we were really concentrated on grammar, but the, the adolescents, the teenagers, uh, picked up on dialectic and rhetoric quite, quite readily. The interesting part that I found is the parents and the grandparents had extremely difficult time uh, considering these ideas. Yeah. They yeah. Really did. Yeah, that's also my experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> Gene, time flies when you're having fun, they say, and <laughs> <laughs> it sure did because when I look at the clock, I'm. Uh, <laughs> I'm amazed that it's already time, uh, because after this show, there's another broadcast. So um, I, th I give you one minute for a final remark, and then we have to uh, leave the air, so to say. Well, whenever anybody asks me that question, uh, I pretty much say the same thing, is, is claim your humanity. Live up to your potential. Start by, by accepting uh, the instruments that nature has given you uh, to see the world and the universe. Your, your five senses. Uh, then try to learn how to learn and, and think uh, effectively to the trivium. And then explore the, the more advanced and more abstract realm of the quadrivium. And when you've done this, when you've uh, 
put your, your foot in the water, so to speak, I think you will have claimed your humanity. This, this is what it means to be uh, uh, a self-aware, self-directed, self-responsible being, a human being. Great, fantastic concluding words, uh, Gene. Thank you very much for being my guest. Listeners, thank you very much for listening to Patea Radio. Next week, we'll do a rerun of the radio interview with uh, Robert Ote. Hope you'll tune in then again. Bye for now.